Good afternoon. Um, I thought I should dedicate one uh, lecture in this course to metrology. Um, metrology is one of those technologies which are not much spoken of. They are very uh, discreet, not very spectacular. And uh, yet, uh, if you want to build the pyramids of Egypt, you need metrology. You need a system of units. You need a system of measurement. So, um, sort of, to some extent, has prepared the ground. And uh, yes, it is a fact that all ancient civilizations have developed systems of units of uh, linear units for measuring lengths, uh, for areas, uh, etc. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, those systems, as you will see, have some deep commonalities. Uh, by now, you should have guessed which ones, especially if you look at this uh, slide here. Uh, but they also have very substantial differences. So let's not imagine that the units in Egypt or in India were the same. They were not. There were lots of, uh, um, you know, cultural ways to define things. Uh, also, we tend to imagine today that there will be one system of unit. For example, we have either the British system of linear units or the metric system. But in ancient civilizations, very often, and I will give examples in India, you had several systems coexisting. So therefore, this uh, need which modern science has developed of standardization, uh, uh, which is, um, uh, it has been a very uh, um, preoccupying problem with physicists in particular. How do you define units rigorously and then standardize them? So even though the metric system is universally adopted in science, we still talk today of Fahrenheit uh, degrees. We still talk sometimes of feet and inches. Uh, so there are some survivors, nevertheless. Plus the fact that um, if you look at a unit like the meter, do you know how the meter was first defined when the metric system was sought to be rigorously scientifically established and then proposed to the whole scientific community. What was the meter? Well, the meter was actually a, length, a rod of some metal, I forget which metal, which was kept in Paris and which measured, by definition, a meter. Of course, it had been kind of calculated because, they, as you well know, units are interdependent. And uh, therefore, there was a particular reason why this length and not some other length should be the meter. But ultimately, the standard was that particular rod. And um, the same with time uh, until, uh, until one day uh, atomic clocks came around and then it was defined as the number of vibrations of a particular atom uh, in, in, in a second, for example. And, uh, but all these definitions actually, even in the last 200 years, have kept being refined further. So today, it's no longer the meter is defined by some travel time of, the, of, of uh, laser ray and things like that. So it has been a problem to define things rigorously, consistently, and uh, um, in a way that could be easily adopted by the whole world. But in the ancient civilizations, of course, the context was very different. So I'm going to try to briefly survey some of these uh, uh, units. But first of all, I want to ask you, why should we measure? Why do you think, what were the motivations in measuring, for example, length? In the ancient civilizations, why should you what kind of occupation, preoccupation, would make you want to measure a length? How does it really matter? Can anyone suggest an answer? Agriculture. So agriculture, why do you need length for agriculture? Yes. 
So actually, I expected this answer for areas because uh, you don't really measure the length of a field, you measure its surface, its area. But it's true that to measure its area, you need a unit of length. So this is one answer. Other answers, other uses for measuring length? Construction? Yes, absolutely. If you want to construct, of course, if you're constructing <coughs> you know, a rubble wall uh, 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 and a rough hut, you don't really need, uh, you, you can measure things uh, with, uh, with your hands or with just, uh, you don't need a rigorous unit. But once you start constructing on the level of a planned city, and I'll give you some examples, then you need something much more reliable. So this is, uh, this is another answer. We will see some other answers in the course of this talk as to why you might want to uh, measure length. So areas, therefore, areas, yes, agriculture, and then as human societies became more complex, the concept of ownership came into the picture at some point. Because initially, <coughs> in Neolithic societies, there was no ownership. The whole village owned the land, as it still is the case with tri most tribal societies. There is no private ownership. But the minute you want to define private ownership, how much do I own? then you need to be able to measure this area. Weights, so Saurav told us about weights. But why do you need weights for? For what purpose? Trade, yes, that's, that's the most obvious answer. Of course, in agriculture also, you might want to weigh your um, output and maybe the state wants to tax you uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the weight you have harvested. But trade is, is, of course, the most obvious answer because once you start putting a value of things, you have to measure them. So <clears throat> whether it is measuring ornaments, um, weighing them, weighing gold perhaps, whatever it may be. You might, want, you might also be trading in grain, in, 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 in wheat, and that also you have to measure. So this is one clear answer. And volumes, which we will not discuss much uh, uh, in this uh, lecture. Maybe I'll briefly explain something about volumes. But volume, when would you measure a volume? There is historically one good reason to measure a volume. And that again is when you want to measure grain. Because actually grain is not really often measured by weight. It is more measured by a particular unit of volume. And this becomes the standard for uh, the trade or the taxing system. In, for example, Arthashastra, uh, when uh, there is a discussion on the taxation <coughs> of agricultural produce, uh, the units which are involved are units of volume, not units of weight. So this is one major reason why you might want. And suppose you are trading in oil, you also have to measure. You're not going to weigh your oil. You're going to measure it by the volume, right? So these are some of the purposes. There are many others. But the question of course, and, and I'm sorry, I was forgetting time. So time, we have, of course, the sunrise and the sunset. That's a good enough natural clock. And if we are smart enough looking at the position of the sun in the sky, maybe we can have an idea. But why else would you want to measure time more precisely? There are quite a few reasons. Sorry? Uh, yes, that's one good answer. <clears throat> if you want to conduct certain rituals at a time which you think is particularly auspicious, then you have to be able to measure that time. Uh, but there are other reasons. Agriculture, well, agriculture 
Yes, yes, absolutely. That will be measuring time on a longer scale, uh, not, not uh, the, the matter of seconds and minutes, but a matter of season, months. Uh, you want to plan for the next sowing season. So you want to know when you should be preparing your land, uh, etc. So you need a calendar. So historically, all ancient civilizations have developed calendars, and you probably know that in India, there are even today many kinds of traditional calendars. Regionally, they are not the same. The calendar of North India, or the official uh, calendar of the government of India, is, is quite different from the Tamil or Malayalam calendars or Bengali. So, so this is known as um, calendrical science, and uh, it developed very early on in many civilizations, including India. And of course, this is about measuring, and why should we measure, but the question is going to be how. So let us try to have a look, but before we do that, I will briefly mention that in India, many things tend to be turned sacred. You know, many activities uh, like construction, uh, agriculture, which uh, today we might call secular, whatever it means, were regarded basically as sacred activities. And it is so in the text, it is, and there will always be some God or goddess to invoke at the beginning of any particular activity and so on. So, measurements also have a God. Units have a God. And that God, you can see him here uh, from the Modera Sun Temple, Surya Mandir, is Vishwakarma. So, Vishwa, universe, karma, the doer, that is to say the, the, the maker of all things, the creator, basically. Vishwakarma is a form very often fused in Vedic times with, um, with Prajapati, later on with Brahma. Uh, he, and then he becomes the architect of the universe. He becomes also the architect of some sacred cities like Dwaraka. All this is, of course, in the text, in the mythologies. But very interestingly, and you can see on this picture his upper left hand, and fortunately, uh, the lower arms are broken, but the upper left hand carries a rod, a measuring rod. So this concept of measurement <coughs> is a very interesting concept which is present in the oldest text of India, which is the Rig Veda, where we have several deities measuring out space. And you know, this becomes also the myth of Vishnu, measuring the whole universe in three steps. You remember this uh, legend of uh, Vishnu, uh, Yes, uh, measuring, uh, this is the Vamana le legend, uh, measuring the cosmos in, in three steps. So this idea of measuring thing uh, runs deep in the Vedic philosophy itself, and uh, it has some social implications because uh, we have communities in India today calling, them, calling themselves Vishwakarma communities. And, um, the main traditional occupations of these communities have been um, construction, architecture, cr sculpture, craft making. Um, you have Vishwakarma architects, you have Vishwakarma uh, metal smiths, you have Vishwakarma carpenters. So uh, the Shtapatis, for example, the traditional architects of India are almost invariably from the Vishwakarma uh, communities. And um, when you speak to them, they are very, very proud of their, of their traditions, of this, they, they claim very, very um, explicitly this connection with the Vedas and the Vedic philosophy through uh, this deity of Vishwakarma. So this is a little bit of the mythological background which, uh, uh, you know, always reminds us that all these activities uh, uh, tended to be uh, made sacred in ancient India. This was the general philosophy. And then we turn to the actual reality of things, beginning with the linear measures, the measurement of length, which is, uh, which is fundamental for many other units. Without units of length, you will not have 
uh, uh, units of surface or volume, and even to some extent, as we will see, uh, time uh, measurement will depend on measurement of length. So this is extracted from a, a, a fine book, one of the very, very few books we have in India on traditional uh, units, and you see uh, some of these uh, basic units, which I will come back to in a few minutes, uh, which are extracted from uh, uh, various texts, and uh, they are all based on the dimensions of our body. Now, this immediately invites some thoughts. What thoughts? If we're going to define units on the human body, what do you think is going to happen? The units will vary, yes. Our bodies are not all the same. And even if we were all the same height, let us assume, which we are not, you will find that one individual has longer arms, another has longer hands. For example, uh, there is a unit called the vitasti, uh, which is here mentioned as 13 angulas, but most often it is 12 angulas, as I will show you. And this is known as the span in English. This is the span of the uh, hand. And it is 12 angulas. And then you have the aratni or hasta. Uh, there are many, many terms. Every unit has three, four, five terms depending on the, the text, depending on the time, sometimes depending on the purpose, who uses. So a carpenter will have one term. A mason may have another term for the same unit. So this also makes things more complicated. We won't go into all these details, but this is supposed, and this qubit, which is still used in, in India, where typically will you find this in actual use today? Very, very often. I've seen it hundreds, hundreds of times. A little louder. To measure the length of? No, no, you will see it in much more humble circumstances. Yes, exactly, in the flower markets. You know, this is the unit by which the length of the flower which you buy, the, the garland, hmm, the mala, is, is measured. So this unit is supposed to be 24 angulas. And this is to, supposed to be 12. But look at what happened. If I take my own from the tip of the elbow, and I really stretch very, very hard, and I do it once again, it doesn't work. I, my, my arm is longer. So please do the exercise and tell me if anybody here has, you stretch very hard your hand, really hard from the tip, tip of the elbow, and take the point very, very correctly, and really start once again. Is anybody reaching the tip of the, the hand? Yes, you are. So you see, bodies are different. So you are, a, from this point of view, you are a far more regular individual than I am because my measurements are not going to be compatible with these proportions. So these are some of the problems that we are going to face. I'll come back to this in a moment. I want to start um, with the Harappan civilization because historically that is where uh, uh, we see activities which demand a certain control of units. This is the Acropolis, or upper part of Mohenjo-daro, where you can see um, streets at right angles, and the, the, these are also incidentally uh, aligned perfectly uh, north-south. And um, <coughs> you find a lot of big, big buildings, and the same goes for most uh, cities of the Indus civilization. They are planned cities. Please note that a city need not be planned. If you look at uh, old uh, Chennai or old Calcutta or old Delhi, these are not planned cities. They are organic growths. But uh, here, this is, it is planned, and you see this kind of grid-like uh, grid pattern uh, which therefore involves measuring out a plan which you have conceived earlier in your mind or on, well, paper did not exist, but whatever it may be, 
and you have to carry it out on the ground. And for this, you need some unit. But before we come to unit, there's something happening, which is proportion. And the Harappans were extremely particular about proportions. They did not want to leave proportions randomly. So for example, this Acropolis of Mohenjo-Daro is exactly twice as long as it is broad. But things do not stop here. If you look at Kalimangan, a much smaller city uh, on the bed of the uh, Sarasvati River in Rajasthan, uh, you will find that on the, on the left part of your, the screen, you will see again the upper part of the city, which we call Acropolis. Some call it citadel, but that is uh, uh, a term which uh, can be disputed anyway. Uh, these are fortified areas, and the proportion is the same as in Mohenjo-Daro. It is twice as long as it is wide, uh, uh, while the lower town on the right has a proportion apparently of two to three. It's not absolutely sure because the southern side was eroded away, but this is the assumption of Professor Bibilal, who excavated this site in the 1960s with other uh, Indian archaeologists. So there are certain proportions, and it is striking especially at Dholavira, where I did a little bit of research on this question of linear uh, unit, which is why I'm going to show you something of the city. So in blue, you have the uppermost part, uh, again, the Acropolis, the uppermost part of the city. It dominates the landscape. And then in pink, you have the middle town and the lower town. And something seems quite harmonious in the proportion, but what exactly is it? So when you look closer, Dr. Bisht, who excavated uh, the site in the 1990s and 2000s, found that there were certain peculiar proportions, like the castle, for example, so-called because of its very thick uh, fortification walls, had a proportion of 5 to 4. OK, 5 to 4 is, is 1.25. Um, uh, and uh, apparently it looks innocent enough, but it's not innocent because the overall city, the outer walls of the overall city have exactly the same proportion and to an amazing degree of precision. The margin of error for the overall city is less than 0.1%. And this is a large dimension. It's 771 meters long and 600 something meters wide. So, and the terrain is not very regular. The terrain has irregularities. So to implement such an accurate ratio over uh, such a terrain, and the ratio is there twice, uh, shows us that uh, they have to have some ways to measure things out. So then other proportions are present. Uh, the, 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 the length of the middle town to the length of the castle, 9 to 4. Now, we say 9 to 4, but 9 to 4 is 5 to 4 plus 1. It's 1.25 plus 1, 2.25. So it, there is also, again, a relation with 5 to 4. And again, the outer, outer wall uh, of the length of the city to the uh, length of the middle town the same ratio of 9 to 4. So something is going on. 6 to 1 is the length of this green patch, which is a huge ceremonial ground, about 280 meters long, uh, where probably public functions, games, markets, whatever it was, uh, uh, were taking place. So precisely, very precisely, 6 to 1. And the middle town, 7 to 6. So. When, and not only that, there are reservoirs, huge reservoirs. This is one of them, the largest on the eastern side of the castle, which you see uh, uh, in the background on the right. And the reservoirs also, the proportions are not random. They are precisely simple ratios of integers, 5 to 2 in this case. Or if you look at the southern reservoir, uh, you have 7 to 2. This is cut in the rock. So the dimensions are very precisely measurable, 7 to 2. And then there's at the bottom, as you can see, there's a secondary reservoir. Its exact purpose is not very, very clear, but it also obeys a simple proportion, 11 to 4. So 
this is strange, and it's not limited to Dolavira or Kalimangan. You find the same ratios at work in other sites. We are now at Harappa. This is one of the largest buildings in the entire Indus civilization. It used to be called a granary, but recent research shows that it probably was never used to store grain. Uh, it was used for some other purpose. There are, uh, the, the dimensions are huge, more than 51 meters length, and all these individual cells which you see uh, are uh, 15 uh, meters, more than 15 meters in length. So what is peculiar is that we have exactly the same ratio of five to four, which we had seen at Dolavira. Uh, five to two, which we also saw at Dolavira for the reservoir, <coughs> for those individual uh, chambers or whatever they might have been. Uh, Lothal, if you take, uh, Lothal is not a perfect rectangle because the, si the, the right side of the, on the right side of the, the photo of the plan, which you see here, uh, there was a kind of an Allah, uh, a, a channel, natural channel, uh, through which probably boats were coming up to Lothal from the Gulf of Kambat. And uh, um, uh, so therefore, they, they decided to follow the profile of the Inala, uh, instead of having a neat rectangle as we would normally expect. But if you take the middle point, you get once again five to four. And if you s look at the dockyard at the bottom, this rectangle, not perfect rectangle again, uh, has a proportion of six to one, which we had also seen at Dolavia. So the pattern is clear, and this could go, and this is the Lothal uh, dockyard. And this could go on. Um, these are <coughs> ratios at uh, uh, Doravira, uh, no, I'm sorry, at uh, Mohanjo-Daro, at the Acropolis of Mohanjo-Daro, which I calculated. And uh, you find, again, various ratios, 3 to 2, 9 to 4, 3 to 1, 5 to 3, etc. So there is an intention, and this is a detailed study of the so-called Great Bath Complex of Mohenjo-Daro. So when you compile it all together, this is what you get. And you can see that this is not every single major Harappan site or structure falls on one of these ratios, the proportions. So there is a preoccupation with ratios, which I think personally is simply that those proportions were seen as particularly auspicious. Uh, this is uh, something which I will show you in a moment. Uh, persists in later India, in classical India, in fact. And, uh, but but uh, the, the point is that to measure these proportions out on the ground, you need a unit. So before we come to this unit, let me jump at least, at least 2,000 years. Uh, the Harappan civilization is in the third millennium BCE, or BC, and we are now around 500, uh, CE or AD, so we've, we've jumped, uh, in fact, uh, nearly 3,000 years. And we have now a text of classical architecture. There are many texts of architecture. I'm taking one of them which comes from South India, the Manasara, which has a lot to say on how to build, uh, how to plan a city, how to uh, conceive of various types of buildings like palaces and halls and so on and so forth and streets, uh, and um, uh, everything that goes into planning uh, a city. <clears throat> and what it tells us, and this is an actual quotation, is that when you're going to design a mansion, a mansion is a grand dwelling, a grand house, you first determine the breadth. You select the breadth, and then you can have different proportions by choosing the length to be equal to the breadth plus a fraction of that breadth. This is the method it tells us very clearly. So it says you start with the breadth. In that case, you obviously, you'll get a square, right? Or you can add one-fourth of the breadth to get the length. So one plus one-fourth is five-fourths, five to four. And this is the proportion we have seen right now. Or you add one and a half, you will get three to two. You, get, you add uh, three fourths, 
of the breadth, you will get 7 to 4. Or you make it twice, then of course 2 to 1, and it goes on. 9 to 4, 5 to 2, 11 to 4, or finally three times. And it is very interesting, and now I come back to the previous slide, that all of these proportions are there in the Harappan civilization. You can spot all of them without exception. So it tells us that perhaps this was how the Harappans themselves were creating those proportions. And uh, why do, why again in Mansara, which is a much later classical text, why are those proportions so important? Because they are conceived to be auspicious, to embed auspiciousness. The, the idea is that nothing should be left to chance, basically. So it's a concern which, of course, disappeared from uh, uh, contemporary architecture. If uh, today, you know, the person who designed this hall here, I'm sure was never concerned about the ratio between the length and the breadth. This is not a contemporary concern. But it was a classical concern in India, and also, of course, in the construction of temples themselves. So, now coming back to Dolavida, I made a calculation which I will not uh, explain in great detail. It's not um, of great importance. Uh, but I simply took all these proportions and I said there's got to be a unit. And it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, largest common multiple kind of calculation. It's very simple. And I found that the, uh, the largest unit because, of course, I could say, well, all, all the dimensions have been measured to the centimeter, so I could say that maybe the centimeter was the Harappan unit, but it wouldn't make sense because you're not going to measure uh, uh, the full length of the city with the unit, which is the centimeter. Nobody would do that. So you have to have a slightly larger unit. And my question was, what was the largest unit which would allow you to express all these dimensions into integral multiples of that unit. It's a very simple problem. And the result of the calculation was that the unit was 1.9 meters. And uh, 1.9 meters gives you these multiples which you see there. The full length becomes 405 times that unit, uh, while the, the um, breadth is 324. Uh, what I found interesting is that a lot of multiples of 10 appeared, like 10 times. 60 times, 80 times, 150 times, 180 times. So this kind of gave me intuitively you know, a, a, a concept. This, these papers have been published that I was on the right track. And then uh, there were additional clues in the city itself. These are two columns which you see uh, when you climb into the castle over, overlooking uh, the rest of the city. There are stone columns. Their exact purpose has been disputed. There are several theories as to why these two columns are there in the middle of the street, the main street of the castle. Uh, but the dimension between, I mean, the, the gap between the two is exactly 3.8 meters. So this happens to be twice the unit I calculated. There are other considerations. I will not trouble you with all the details, but I'll take this one. This is a huge uh, funerary chamber. It's one of the largest tombs ever found in the Harappan civilization. It's outside the fortified area on the western side of the city. And this funerary structure, which dates back to, the, to Harappan times, uh, this has been established by the, the pottery. As you can see, in the middle of the, in the center of the sketch has a chamber where probably some very, very important figure was buried. We may imagine that it was the king of Dolavira, possibly. The problem is that when it, it was open, there was nothing. There was just some um, funerary pottery there. Uh, was the body removed? Was it never buried, which is called technically by archaeologists a symbolic burial? All, all possibilities are there. But anyway, the dimensions are 1.9 meters deep for this chamber, 1.9 meters wide, and 3.8 meters uh, long. So I think this makes a very strong case for this particular unit. Now, the next question I asked was, if we had this unit, they must have had also smaller units. 
So I tried to start from the, the finger, the digit, because usually this is kind of the basic unit. I'm coming back to this briefly in a moment. It's kind of the basic unit. So what could be uh, the Harappan digit, which in later classical literature will be called the angula, and you, you all know this word, uh, anguli, uh, the, the finger. And uh, there were several scales uh, which did not make much uh, sense. One was found in Harappa, one was found in Mohenjo-daro. They showed very different kinds of units, and nobody has really been able to make those units work with the dimensions uh, found in those sites. Uh, but the Lothal scale, uh, which is engraved, as you can see, in some kind of bone or ivory, uh, and we, you, which, you, which you can see when you visit the Lothal Museum, uh, has a unit which is 1.77 millimeters. So <coughs> uh, one Indian metrologist, this is the technical term for these uh, experts, uh, the, there are very few of them, uh, but there used to be a metrology department uh, uh, in one of the uh, earlier uh, industry ministries. And um, uh, 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 Meinkar was his name, and he has published a series of papers, um, did a, late, a calculation based on the later angula found in the Arthashastra. Uh, I'm coming to it in a moment. And he found that uh, the Arthashastra angula was very precisely 10 times this graduation. So he felt confident that probably the Harappan uh, uh, angula was about 1.77 uh, or 1.78 uh, centimeter. And uh, more recently, uh, Professor R. Balasubramaniam, uh, I should say late R. Balasubramaniam, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, at a young age from IIT Kanpur, worked on a terracotta scale found in Kalibangam and uh, found that the grooves, uh, measuring them carefully, and I was privileged to collaborate with him uh, on this bit of research, uh, was indicating a, a unit of 1.75. Now, <clears throat> I was tempted to say, okay, we have 1.77, 1.75. Let me take the average and see what happens. Though this is not exactly how I proceeded because I had worked out this value of 1.76, in fact, earlier. But let us take this uh, method and see what happens. Could it be that 1.76 centimeter is the Harappan angular? And if so, how does it relate to this unit of 1.9 meters? I found that the factor between the two was exactly 108. Now, this became extremely interesting for two reasons. One is that 108 in later classical India is a sacred number, very sacred. But let us forget about that. Arthashastra gives us two units for the dhanush. I'm coming to that. One of which, because as I told you, sometimes units are different for different occupations. So the carpenter has one unit by a name and the same unit by the same name for the mason or the town builder may have a different value, which is precisely the case here. The dhanush in classical normal literature is 96 angulas. I'm coming to it. But in the case of city building, which is what we, we have in Dolavira, then it has a higher value, which is 108 angulas. So it looks as an exact parallel what Arthashastra, which as you should know, is about roughly 300 BC. So that would still be 2,000 years after the Harappan civilization. And what it reflects as this system of unit is precisely what we seem to see in Harappan city. So this is in a way a work in progress. There is more to, to uh, work out, more data to be accumulated. Uh, but it, it tells us uh, that these are likely units that the Harappans were using. Now, later on, later on, we have a text called the Shulba Sutras, which is datable to 6th to 8th century BC, hmm, BCE, and which is the very, very first text of mathematics in India, the very first. 
And this text is concerned with only one thing, which is construction of fire altars. It's a ritual text. It's a text of constructing ritual uh, uh, tools, which are fire, simple fire altars made of bricks of different shapes. I'm not going to explain the whole of it. It would take us too long. Uh, you can have a circular shape. You can have a square shape. You can have a, a rectangular shape. You can have the shape of a falcon, uh, the shape of a tortoise, uh, whatever shape. But all these are to have the same area. It's only the shape that is free to change, but the area cannot change, and it is defined precisely in the text. So, therefore, for different shapes, and, and these altars additionally have five layers, each layer made of a different shape of bricks. They're not allowed to repeat the same uh, shapes of bricks layer after layer. It has to change for each layer. So the constructions become very intricate and involve a lot of measurement of areas of triangles, square, rectangles, but not only measurements, transformation of one surface into another. For example, transforming a square into a rectangle or into a square twice its size or into a triangle of the same area and so on. So very intricate geometrical construction, all of which rest on this system of units which you see here, where, and we have for the first time in India, a proper definition. However, even though it is proper and precise, there are still uncertainties about it because the basic unit is the angular, and the angular here is defined as 40 grains of anu. Anu actually means an atom or a very tiny particle. And, uh, uh, but this is also synonymous in, in that period with a kind of millet. You know that millets can be very, very tiny. And uh, uh, millet grains, and this is how it is defined. The problem is that we don't know exactly what millet they were using as a reference. And even if we knew, today's millets have changed in size. You know? uh, they, they've been improved upon, they've been uh, hybridized, uh, so we still might not be able to recreate the precise Shulba Sutra angular. So therefore, the, we have to be content with some rough estimates. And uh, then from this, the pradesha, which is another word for the hand span of 12 angulas. Uh, there is a pada, which is a, a kind of a foot. Uh, the foot never had in Indian measurement system the importance it had in other cultures or civilizations, like for example, the British system. Uh, but you know, even in the British system, though this foot is used, what is the value of a foot in centimeters? 30, 30 something, almost 30.5. How many people have feet of 30 centimeters, 30 and a half? If you measure your feet, you have? You do? But what is your foot size in, um, what, what shoe size do you buy? 12, yes, 12 would be close to uh, one foot. So, but, but the common foot is usually smaller than this. So anyway, uh, this is just to say that these uh, uh, names are all uh, relative. They are just basic references. The Ardni 24 angular is again the cubit, and then there are other units all the way to the Purusha. But the Purusha here in the Shulva Sutra system is not the height of a man this way to the top of the head. It is the height of a man with, to the top of the extended arm. This is how it is defined and it is said to be 120 angulars. I'm coming back to this value shortly, but before that, let us see now, a few centuries later, what Arthashastra, this text of Kautilya, which as you know, is about governance, about administration, about the various ministries that uh, constitute the state, about taxation, about economics, and so on and so forth. And when you have a state, you have an administration, you have a taxation system, you need systems of units. So here, the angula is no longer uh, defined in terms of millet. It is defined in terms of barley. Barley is a very ancient crop. Barley existed in India and in the Indian subcontinent 
all the way to Neolithic Mehergar, uh, 6000 BC also. So it's not a new crop, but it is found to be obviously more uh, convenient or reliable. And these eight grains are put widthwise. This is what the text tells us, widthwise, not lengthwise, but widthwise. And uh, you get this value which Mainka had calculated using, actually carrying out a lot of tests with different barleys uh, so that he would remain close to the text. Then Dhanur Graha is four angular. What is four angular? It is actually the palm of the hand. Dhanur Graha is what catches Graha, the Dhanush, which is the bow. So this is with what we, you catch the bow with. It is your, uh, it is this. So the base of the fingers is four angulas. And once again, uh, 20 angulas for the span, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 12, and uh, 24 for the, uh, for the um, cubit, and a, a dhanush, which is supposed to be the normal height of a man, of 96 uh, angulas up to here. But then the, the, this dhanush has another definition, as I mentioned, for city walls uh, or for the construction of altars. So you see that different purposes could give different values to the units, which can make the problems very intricate. So now, <clears throat> I'll try to explain briefly what Saurav tried to touch upon. This value of the angular. So this is uh, the Arthashastra definition, but sometimes, uh, especially in the south, it will be de de uh, defined in terms of grain of rice, but that doesn't help us much because we know that rice, again, can vary hugely in length. <clears throat> However, Arthashastra gives another definition, which is the maximum width of the middle finger of a middling man. So a man of average height, we'll have to ask who is of average height, what is the average height, and the m width of the middle finger. Unfortunately, there will be wide variations again in the, in the size of fingers. Varahani Rahu uh, was in the 6th century uh, uh, CE or AD and wrote an encyclopedia called Brihat Samhita, uh, uses the same definition, but he has in addition, I'm coming to that, uh, uh, the heights for a short, average, or tall man. And then later on we had uh, British scholars trying to interpret those values and uh, deciding that uh, the angular was roughly equating three-fourths of an inch, which is 1.9 centimeter. But as we saw, Mainka preferred 1.78. However, it doesn't stop there because when the shtapatis construct images of buildings, and they do use the angulars, they have a very peculiar tradition to embed the memory of the head shtapati, the constructor of a temple, for example, the, in uh, Tanjavur, uh, the name of the shtapati who constructed the temple is there in the inscriptions. To preserve the memory, the whole temple is built on the angula defined as the phalanx of his thumb. And uh, usually this uh, becomes 3.5 centimeters. This is the value that Kanapati Shtapati, who was a great uh, Shtapati of Tamil Nadu, uh, who built in particular the um, image of uh, uh, Tiruvalluvar at Kanyakumari, among many other uh, buildings. <coughs> and uh, the definition he gave was this, about 3.5 centimeters. So 3.5 centimeters is still related to the old angula because 1.75 uh, will be half of it. So there is some organic relation, but um, it is not very clear how it is going to work uh, because then it, it means that there is no desire to standardize, for example, uh, the temples, all of them on a single unit. Um, let me now come to this problem of the height of a man because there are two schools of thought. One which says that the angular is 1.9 centimeter, uh, the other that uh, 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 which uh, uh, I used in my ca own calculations in the Harappan civilization that it was 1.76 angular, and you can have fun if you want measuring the thickness of the 
middle of your finger. And, um, but the problem is that when Varamira gives us the height of a tall man, a medium man, or a short man, he says there are 108 angulas, 96 angulas, and 84 angulas. This is what he says. Now, calculating with the two possible values, see what we get. Now, the question is, which one is closer? For example, for the medium man, will it be 182 or will it be 169? Which will be the closer to the real average tallness of an Indian? It looks like it is 169, and I will show you proof of this. And uh, if you look at the tall man, again, 190 centimeter is not that uncommon. It's, it does occur. But 205 is really very, very tall. And uh, similarly for shortness, 160 cm or 148. Uh, so this, of course, the two, the two are possible. But when we look at the medium height and the tall height, the smaller angula seems to make more sense. Now, this is a summary of <coughs> the different definitions in different texts. Uh, the Shul Shulba Sutra, uh, the Arthashastra of Kotilya, Aryabhatiya of Aryabhata, Varahamira, whom I mentioned, and later on, uh, Bhaskaracharya. And when you look at all these values together, <coughs> you can see that there is basically, uh, there is a common philosophy in building up the multiples, uh, especially the 12 angulas, the 15 angulas, the 30 angulas, 96 angulas, 108 angulas, all of that uh, is shared. Uh, but the basic definition of the angula is non-standard. And this is something we have to remember. Uh, the, on the higher side, um, among, beyond the uh, danda, which is another name for the dhanush, uh, we have the raju, which is 10 times uh, the uh, dhanush. And then we have uh, 2,000 times uh, the, uh, the dhanush, which is a uh, goruta, or a krosha. Now, the krosha sort of gave one definition of how far you can hear a cow bellowing. But the texts give another definition of, for the, uh, uh, actually for the yojana, I'm sorry, which is, uh, which is uh, four times that much. Uh, the yojana is either 8,000 heights of a man, so that could give us a good measure, and I have done some calculations around that, or it is the distance that a bullock cart can travel during one day. Now, that, of course, is not precise. But this is the origin of the word. Yojana is from yoke. The, the English word yoke has the same root, eh? because uh, the, the bullocks are yoked, and this is uh, the distance that they, they, they can travel during the day. So there are various, uh, it boils down to various units. It can be seven kilometers. If you take 8,000 heights of a man, it will be 13.6 kilometers, and there are still some higher values for the Yojana. So this makes the work of historians of science difficult because especially in astronomy, those units come up. They come up for the diameter of the Earth. They come up uh, for the diameter of uh, the Moon, the Sun, the distances of some uh, uh, celestial bodies. And therefore, very often, the astronomers are not at all sure what is the margin of error. Uh, or, or, or accuracy as you like. Now remember <coughs> some of the units we have seen. This is the famous uh, drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of the Vitruvius or Vitruvian man. Who was Vitruvius? Vitruvius was a Roman architect who precisely 2,000 years ago or maybe 2,050 years ago wrought a monumental treatise of architecture where he put down all the uh, conventions that good architects should follow. Something like our own classical text of architecture in India, but this is older than them. And he set out in particular 
the proportions of the human body. And these are the units that he used. The digit, the pound of four digits, the span of 12, the cubit of four, and four cubits for the height. Exactly the same units that uh, Cotillia mentioned a few centuries earlier. So did, is it that traditions traveled from one place to another? It's possible. Or is it simply that they were anyway trying to build things out of the human body and therefore figured out that anyway these are the proportions that are going to work? All of that is possible. Coming now to the, yes? Sorry, sorry. Vitruvius is the first century BC, and a little bit of the first century AD also. He's just across. And so this is, let's say, roughly 2,000 years old. Uh, uh, this is the date of his text. And, um, and in the Renaissance, because Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who, who draws this uh, and tries to work out the proportions of the human body, inscribing the body in a square, in a circle, you know, they were playing a, a lot with all these concepts, uh, of course, belongs to the Renaissance. And in the Renaissance, all these you know, Roman concepts, uh, um, Greek, I should say Greco-Roman concepts, because the Romans borrowed a lot from the Greeks, experienced a, a rebirth uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, were integrated in the new uh, schools of uh, architecture in particular. And you see at the bottom, Leonardo da Vinci's writing, uh, it's not an accidental inversion of the image. He used to write in, mirror, in, in, a, in the mirror direction. So we write from left to right. He used to write from right to left, and all of it mirrored, so that people would not be able to easily you know, peep over his shoulder and understand. Anyway, this is <coughs> from um, I will show you why in a minute. Uh, from an excavation at Shringverpur in Uttar Pradesh, which Professor Bibilal uh, directed in the 1970s, it is a site uh, which figures in the Ramayana. The name is mentioned, Shringaverapura. And he wanted to see whether there were any particular remains. He found actually a whole uh, very impressive chain of reservoirs. But then he started also. Uh, for a reason which you will understand uh, shortly, measuring the physical dimensions of the workers, the, the people who the excavation branch employed at the site. And uh, you can see now the actual height uh, ranging from uh, there's one, uh, I, 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 I think that's a spelling mistake perhaps. It should be 167 at the top. Uh, all the way to uh, 169. So the average is 1.66. Uh, this is in the 1970s, 1.66 centimeters. So we can see that this is definitely the lower value that Varahamira was giving us. And then uh, measuring also the palm, measuring uh, the span, and measuring the uh, uh, cubit. Now, when you divide all these measurements, by the theoretical number of angulas that they represent, whether it's 96 angulas for the height, or four for the palm, 12 for the span, and 24 for the cubit, uh, you get different values for the angulas. You get anything between 1.73 and 1.88. So therefore, this shows us the, the variability of the whole thing. And, uh, why did he want to do these measurements? Because at Shringverpur, he excavated this beautiful terracotta uh, head of Shiva, obviously because of the third eye. And um, then he realized that there was some very high sense of proportion in them. And when he took measurements, all the measurements carefully uh, between all the you know, dimensions uh, and proportions of the, of the head, he found that the unit which makes the best, best sense was 1.9 centimeter. So this is actually interesting because this is the larger of the two angulas which we were discussing. 
And uh, it works very well. If you take 1.76, which is the lesser angular, it doesn't work. You don't get these uh, multiples like twice, uh, 1.93 times 1.94 times 1.9, three and a half times 1.9, and so on for all. So, but it shows us, irrespective of the debate of, of the actual angular, that by this time, Indian sculptors had become very particular about imposing proportions and specific measurements on uh, their images. So this is part one part of the technology known as iconography, the making of icons. There are other aspects to it, but uh, you will find, and I think Sora have used one of these <coughs> sketches in his own presentation, uh, you will find that all of the images are very, very strictly defined uh, for each part of the body. So whether it is uh, uh, the, the, the kirti, the crown, the head itself, the neck, uh, the upper portion of the chest, and so on and so forth, all the way to the feet, every uh, uh, has a certain proportion, which here, if you look at the leftmost statue, uh, you will see here defined in terms of angulars. All these are angulars, but why do you have different values? Any idea? Why are these values not the same? Why not just one set of values? Why should you vary? Mm, you can't guess? Uh, yes, kind of, depending on the status, status of the god. So for lesser gods, usually it will be 100 or a little less angulas, uh, but uh, all the way to, for example, Varahamira in Brihat Samhita says that uh, uh, for a god as high as Rama, it should be 120 angulas. But apart from these values, what is remarkable is the sense of proportion. And uh, this is known in uh, sculpture as tala. Now, where have you heard the word tala? Exactly, in classical Indian music. Tala is rhythm. And this is the same here. They want that there should be a rhythm visible in the uh, statues or in buildings, uh, this is one reason why all these proportions are imposed and not left to chance, that there has to be a harmonious rhythm in things. So whether it is in music or in sculpture, the principle is basically the same. And you can see from the other dr uh, uh, drawings, and many of them you can find in a big book um, um, called Indian Iconography, uh, which sum sums up the whole science of the late Ganapati Shtapati. Uh, so there are many, many such drawings. And there are many situations uh, where different proportions will be used. But there has to be some very clearly defined set of proportions. Now, when you look at some of the more recent texts uh, which the Shtapatis are using, all the system of units is defined. And it starts from the Paramanu. The Paramanu is the atom, the smallest possible particle of matter, the smallest building block of matter. So there's a philosophical angle to it. Uh, Paramanus are discussed in texts like the Vaisheshika Sutras, for example. Uh, but apparently, it plays a role in defining uh, units of length, because eight of these make a speck of dust. Eight specks of dust make the tip of a hair. Eight tips of the hair make the egg of a louse. You know louse, plural lice. You know what that is? Those tiny parasites uh, uh, we get sometimes in the hair. And uh, uh, eight eggs of a louse makes a louse itself. Uh, eight times that becomes a grain of barley. Eight grains of barley. Tell, uh, it will make a superior angular, but there is also a medium angular, which is only seven grains, or a lesser angular, 
which is six grains of barley. So you can see two things. First of all, the initial units given here are purely nominal. Nobody can measure without scanning electron microscope or some mo other modern method the dimension of an atom. So it is nominal, it is conceptual, it is not, uh, it is something just for the beauty of having a complete system uh, with some philosophical angle behind it. It is not something real. Uh, the real units are beginning, most probably, I don't know whether they bothered measuring lice. Uh, I'm not very, very sure about that. Possibly, it is, they, they would be measurable. But definitely with the uh, uh, grains of barley, then we are beginning to have. And see here, this is from a later text, possibly 11th century or so. We have explicitly not two, but three different angulas. So therefore, uh, my answer to the angular problem is that both can be accepted. We don't have to exclude either the lesser angular of 1.76 centimeter, uh, which came out of different considerations, or including Varaha Mira, or the higher angular of 1.9 centimeter. We need not choose one. We can accept both. And in fact, in this later text, uh, uh, three of them uh, become acceptable. Now, how is, uh, uh, before I briefly deal with a few other uh, units, uh, how are all these been measured for the ancient stapatis? The new stapatis we know, we know their traditions, they tell us, but how do we verify? So there have been a number of studies, especially for temples in Karnataka and in Tamil Nadu. There are several experts in Karnataka. One, uh, Dr. Jagadish, published a whole book on this where actually uh, they have gone to the temples and they found that they were graduated scales engraved on usually the plint. You know, the plint is uh, the edge of the platform where the temple is erected. And you can see here those vertical lines uh, at the top, at the bottom. These are scales. These are scales which the head stapati has decided, determined, and the whole temple will be built on the basis of this scale. So even though units were not standardized, they could be very well, very precise nonetheless for any speci particular specific use. Now let me say something about weights. Weights, uh, this is something we could, we could spend a long time on. I'm going to be fairly brief uh, because we are lucky that uh, in Harappan times, we have a, a number, hundreds and hundreds of weights have been found. The Harappans were great traders. It was, in fact, the main activity, producing goods that could be traded and trading in those goods. So uh, you had a lot of craftsmen, manufacturers, and you had people taking those goods all the way to Central Asia, to Mesopotamia. Uh, um, uh, all this is well documented. <coughs> And these weights have been weighed. Uh, what the standard textbooks will tell you is that there are basically two series. One starts at about 0.86 grams. Um, uh, one of you asked why 0.86 grams. Well, there has to be some standard. Uh, it's possible that this was a convenient unit for small objects like uh, semi-precious stones, for example. But one would have to do a study of weighing hundreds of them to see if there is some correlation. And uh, these weights uh, uh, were made of stone, uh, usually a hard stone, which is called chert. Chert is a stone which you find uh, in the Rory Hills of Sindh uh, in, in uh, Pakistan today, and possibly a few other regions. Uh, but uh, they need not always have been made of uh, chert. Some were made of agate. Uh, the advantage of chert was that it is very, it's a very, very hard stone. So it will not wear out easily. And when you have a weight, you don't want it to wear out because if it gets worn out, if the edges get rounded off, then obviously the value of the weight is no longer accurate. So therefore, you need a hard stone. Uh, so mostly cubes. 
But some systems have been found, especially with agate, as truncated spheres, you know, where uh, uh, you, you take a sphere and you cut off uh, uh, the two poles uh, uh, at, at a height that will give you the, the desirable weight. So one series is like this. It's a geometric series. You'd keep doubling the value, the initial value. And normally one would expect that they would continue, but they don't. For some reason, which has not been fully worked out, there are a few theories in the field, uh, Harappan switched to decimal multiples of some of the earlier values. So for example, six, 160 is 16 times 10, 200, that's 100 times 2, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and you even have 8,000, which is 1,000 times 8, et cetera. And the last weight is about 10 kilograms. So that's, that's a big chunk of stone, and uh, obviously very, very heavy. So with this, they could measure a whole range of, of things, of goods, uh, whether small artifacts, objects that were produced for trading, so possibly a, a grain. Uh, uh, we, we don't exactly know all the, the uses that they were put to, but it's a fact that these weights have been found in two predominant locations. One is entrances to the cities. For example, there are gateways at Harappa. When those gateways were excavated, they found some of the weights buried there, which shows you that there were guards at the entrance of the city weighing goods that were either coming in or going out. And very interestingly, Asta Shastam, 2,000 years later, describes precisely that scene. Kautilya tells us that there has to be a guard at the entrance of the city weighing uh, goods for taxation purpose. So whether taxation happened in Harappan times 2,000 years earlier, we don't know. We have no idea about that. But uh, Kautilya describes precisely that situation. The second place where weights have been found are large houses which uh, um, um, were houses of traders. Uh, in those houses, very often also, some hordes of uh, semi-precious stones were found Sometimes also Harappan seals, you would have heard about those mysterious Indus or Harappan seals, which are still undeciphered. So, so therefore, there is no, at least one thing is sure, that these weights were used in a context of trade. And it is, of course, a matter of common sense. So uh, more recently, <coughs> other uh, series of weights were found. At Dolavira, for example, series of weights were found which are not fully integrated in these. So there seems to be different systems for different purposes. And after all, it makes sense. If you're do dealing with jewelry, with you know, semi-precious uh, uh, stone material, or with gold, uh, you need not use the same system that you know, uh, uh, a, a, a mason or a carpenter would be using if he wants to, to weigh something. So it's quite possible that there were several systems uh, simultaneously in use, and we don't have the last word on the Harappan weight system. Yeah. You see, <coughs> the problem is, uh, that's a good question, but the problem is that we know next to nothing about Harappan government, government or administration. There is no Harappan literature. We don't have a Harappan Arthasastra. Uh, that doesn't exist. Uh, even if the script was deciphered, there are very, very, very short inscriptions, some names. It would be good to know what they did, but we, don't, we will not have text anyway. So the kind of rule that the Harappans were experiencing, administration, can only be partly and very imperfectly reconstructed from the archaeological record. So what can be said here is that those weights were pretty standardized over the entire civilization. And not only over the entire civilization, in the Persian Gulf, where the Harappans were trading a lot with, uh, uh, for example, what is today the Emirates and Kuwait and Oman, uh, a lot of Harappan goods have been found, Harappan jewelry, uh, Harappan pots, even pottery. Uh, so the Harappan presence is very well established. And 
there were a series of weights which were found there, which was, were called once upon a time the Dilmun weights. Dilmun was one name of the ancient civilization of the Emirates of the Bron at, in the time of the Bronze Age, at the time of the Harappan. These Dilmun weights are nothing but the Harappan weights. They absolutely conform to the Harappan standards. So this standardization is a very um, important and peculiar feature of the Harappan civilization, which will be the degree of standardization in proportion of bricks in the design of the seals. Those indices, I'm not showing them uh, today, but you would have seen some of them uh, uh, in your class history textbooks maybe, those small seals of stereotype, they were standardized in iconography, in design, in where the script would appear on the seal. Uh, then you have standardization of town planning. I showed you how, for example, Kalibangan follows the same pattern that you find uh, in, in uh, Mohanjo Daro. There will be some differences here and there, but the town planning concepts are the same all over the civilization, and so on and so forth. So uh, the art, the, some classical shapes of pots are found identically in Gujarat or in Haryana or in Punjab. Uh, some, are, some designs on those pots also uh, are classical and common to all. So there was an incredible degree of standardization which actually will be lost in the later Indian civilization that will emerge in the Ganges and other regions. Uh, which Kautilya, for example, you know, describes, uh, uh, things will not be so standardized and, as in the Harappan times. So the big question is, why were they so particular about standardization? And who made sure that things worked out well? And, and, and there's no answer to these questions because the, the Harappan rulers are completely invisible. There is no statue of a king uh, there is no palace anywhere or no building at least that you can easily identify as a palace as you could in the Egyptian civilization. You can say, well, obviously this is where the pharaoh must have lived. You can't do that in the Indus civilization. So you can only say that they lived in the upper parts of the city. So anyway, this, uh, this is a very tantalizing question, but the archaeological record does not permit a, a, a precise answer. So now, two things about the Harappan ways is that not only they were standardized, not only they were traveling all the way to the Persian Gulf, but even though the Harappan civilization disintegrated in the second millennium BC, in the first millennium BC, after a gap of <clears throat> 1,500 years, the first Indian coins appear, which you see here on this slide. And there are coins made of silver. Harappans did not have coins. They had no currency. Uh, we don't, the, the trade was all based on barter, that is exchange. You, know, you, you agree that this particular bead is worth so many liters, perhaps, of, of wheat or barley. Or, I mean, you, you just have conventions in, in, in barter trade, and it's just a matter of convention. In fact, all trade is a matter of convention. Even the value of gold today is a matter of convention. So, so silver was used uh, to make the first coins of India, which are called punch-marked coins, because you can see that they have marks uh, which were actually punched on the coin, and silver being a soft metal, it was very easy to do that. Uh, they had dye, uh, dyes. Uh, of uh, hard metal, probably iron, uh, and uh, they used to, and these dyes had so many different patterns and symbols which are not very well understood at all. But look at the shapes. Are the shapes very geometrical? No. Why? Why is that? Why can't they make nice squares or nice circles as we have today? The answer is very simple. And you have it there, right there in the text. It's because these coins also had to have a very precise weight. Their weight was not random. And therefore, after flattening of sheet of silver, 
They were apparently not very particular about getting a, a, a nice regular shape, which should have been possible. So they kind of kept cutting it until they achieved the desirable weight. And someone called Didi Kosambi, uh, who was actually a mathematician by formation, uh, and uh, who, who, who worked, in, who did mathematics in Pune, but then turned to history at some point. Uh, he's known as the father of Marxist historiography in India, that is the application of Marxist theories of society uh, to the Indian situations. And anyway, um, he also did some very original work, like for example here at Taxila or Taxashila, today in northern Pakistan, uh, which as you know was one of the earliest uh, major educational establishments in ancient India. We call it a university, it was a complex of monasteries, uh, maybe not a university in the sense that Nananda was, but anyway, uh, there was a very vibrant community life there, and um, uh, thousands, literally thousands of these coins were excavated from Takshila and many more from other parts of North India. So when he weighed the, all these coins, he found that it was not a continuous distribution at all, that they were, you know, clustering on some specific values, and he found that these values were more or less the Harappan values. So that was an amazing discovery because there's a gap of 1,500 years, and somehow the values survived. And not only, not only, in Taxila in 500 or 600 BC, but all the way to the 20th century, before independence, when the metric system was not yet in force, and you are all, I mean, most of you here are too young, uh, but if you ask your grandparents and ask them the kind of units that were used in uh, vegetable markets uh, before independence, it was not the kilogram. It was different regional units. Again, Mainka has produced a number of papers documenting all these traditional units region-wise, uh, linear units, volume units, weight units, <coughs> and, um, uh, and uh, the, you see some of the names there, like Karsha, Rati, and so on. And uh, one British scholar, Michener, found when he put them in parallel with Harappan weights, uh, he found that surprisingly, look at the top row and compare with the bottom row, he found that the value um, was actually very close. Uh, you see uh, 0.85 for the Harappan value, 0.84 if I round off uh, for the traditional uh, value all the way to the 20th century, and so on, 1.7 gram, 1.67 gram, 3.4, 3.35, there's too much of a coincidence. So what we see here is a unique tradition carried for almost uh, 4,500 years where we have the intermediary of the, you know, punch mark coins, but there is a gap between the Harappan weights and the punch mark coins. We don't know, uh, we don't have artifacts to fill that gap as yet, and, uh, and uh, we find that uh, this tradition survived all the way to uh, the imposition of the metric system. And even that metric system, uh, you know, it took years for people to abandon old units. And uh, sometimes uh, you, you may still find uh, some very elderly people still using some of the old, uh, just as, you know, uh, the rupee itself had the system of annas, so you might have heard your grandfather talked of 16 annas or uh, eight annas and all these coins existed and then of course were uh, uh, removed when the whole thing was standardized. So in the same way, weight systems also had those. Yeah? Yes. Yes, they do come. They do come. I have not given the full system, uh, but they do come. There will be higher units of weight and uh, yes, we have all these uh, which will be multiples of the smaller units. Uh, I should have given the, 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 the full system. Uh, the thing is that, again, there is a lot of regional variation. So uh, Mainka has studied all this. He's the only one, to my knowledge, who has done. Uh, but there is 
Uh, and I should say in surface areas also. See, uh, have you, do you know if you want to buy a plot of land in Gujarat here, and you go to the local farmer, is he going to speak to you in terms of hectare? Definitely not. In terms of acre, mostly not. Mostly not. What is the unit he's going to use? Exactly, the big R. This is the unit that they will talk. But there's a problem with the big R. Have you looked? I have researched the big R a little bit. But the big R here in Gujarat is completely different from the big R in Haryana and different from the big R in Punjab and the big R in Bengal. So this is a relic of these old systems of measurements where things are not always standardized. So as long as people know, you know, what they're talking about, like uh, uh, Bengali is not going to come here uh, and, and buy a piece of land here. So within a certain community or sets of communities, people know what they are talking about. So there's no confusion. But if you try to use this at the national level, it's going to be total confusion. You can't. So you need, in the modern world especially, you need to standardize things. Uh, let me briefly talk, I have a few minutes, about time, and we have already seen the, the purposes of time division and the uses of time division. But the very, very first text in India, uh, well, of course, in the Vedas, you do have some concept of season, some concept of rhythm, of year, and, and all of that. But it's not explained in a systematic way. The first text that does it is Vedanga Jyotisha, which is usually dated to about 1400 BC. <coughs> and it's, it's a text of uh, calendrical science. People call it a text of astronomy. Yes, it refers to some celestial phenomena, uh, but it's not really concerned about uh, you know, celestial bodies or things like that. It's absolutely concerned with time division. How do you, you see, there are, uh, in, in, for time, the most important thing to understand, and it's a matter of common sense, is that you have natural units of time. For example, the day. But we may think that the day is a simple unit from sunrise to sunrise, for example. It's not, because we know that in the course of the year, the length of the day changes. So then you could say, OK, I'll take the day from the rising of a particular star to this next rising of that same star. So this is known as the sid sidereal day, you know, star-defined day. Uh, so you have the sun-defined day, the, st the star-defined day, but you have also other types of uh, units of day. So it's not, it's never simple, in fact, even when you use natural rhythm. If you want to use the year, let us say the year, ancient civilizations mostly did not use the solar year, not at first. They preferred to use the lunar year, so what is a lunar year? It is 12 lunar months. And what is a lunar month? <coughs> yes. Quite correct. So that means, in other words, if I may put it differently, from full moon to full moon or from New moon to new moon, that would be a lunar month, right? But actually, there are irregularities, and there are complexities also. It's not going to be that simple. You can also define the position of the moon with regard to a particular star, and when it comes back to it after a certain number of revolutions, and that will give you a different value. So you have different ways to define all these natu so-called natural cycles. And, but basically, they will be that. They will be the, the, the day, uh, though there may be several days. They will be the paksha, which is what you were talking about, Mana, the, the half of the lunar month. Then you will have the lunar month. Then you will have the season. And, then you, and there are six seasons, traditionally, in the Indian calendar, not four. Four season is a European uh, concept based on, of course, the European climate. And then you will have finally the lunar year. The problem with the lunar year is that usually it's going to be somewhere between 355 and 360 
days. There are several values for it. Uh, so what are going, what's going to happen? Does it match uh, the solar year? It does not. So therefore, you have a mismatch. And if you don't do anything, this mismatch is going to accumulate from year to year. If you have, say, five days or seven or eight days mismatch, well, the next year it will be double that. And in the end, you're, you, have complete, you are completely shifting away from the solar cycle. And the solar cycle, after all, is what makes the season. The season are made by the sun. The seasons are not made by the moon. So therefore, almost all calendars in the world, lunar calendars, because it's very easy to notice the full moon or the new moon. It's extremely easy. And that is why uh, uh, the, all ancient civilizations have preferred a, a, a lunar calendar because this monthly rhythm of the moon comes. You don't have an easily defined monthly rhythm for the sun, for example. So therefore, to minimize this problem of mismatch between the lunar calendar and the solar calendar, what you do is that after a few years, you insert artificially an extra month, which is called adhikamasa in Sanskrit. So this extra month may be of 12 days, it may be of 24 days, it may be of different values. Some uh, and you may choose, it's purely a matter of convention, to do it every two years, every five years, it all depends. Uh, uh, they, all these systems have existed. So it's a very complex uh, uh, science. And um, <clears throat> in the case of uh, India, you may notice in the official calendar, for example, tomorrow we celebrate Holi. Does Holi come every year on the same date of the Gregorian calendar? It does not. It does not because this official calendar is still lunar-based. But if you notice carefully, after a few years of drifting, there's a jump. And it jumps back into a, in a, another extreme position. And that jump is due to the insertion of this adhikamasa, or uh, uh, additional intercalary month, as it is called. So all lunar calendars do that except one. There is one calendar in the world, and I think some of you have been my students earlier, so you know what I'm talking about. It is the Islamic calendar. Islamic calendar is completely moon-defined, but because of some theolo theological reason that you know, the, the, the religious authorities decided that they had no right to interfere and add an intercalary month, and therefore they should let the, the lunar calendar be. And therefore, the Islamic calendar does not care to catch up with the uh, solar cycle at all. And after all, it's all a matter of convention. So therefore, the Islamic festivals keep drifting continuously. They never jump back, as is the case. With the so this is a very brief explanation of calendrical systems, extremely brief, and now, uh, this is what the Vedanga Jyotisha of about 1400 BCE uh, tells us. Yuga. Now, Yuga, you may be familiar with these colossal Yugas in Mahabharata or in the Puranas, which can extend to millions of years or more. Well, in the Vedic period, a Yuga is five years. Why five years? Because, in fact, this is a lunar year of 360 days, normalized lunar year. Five days are lost to the solar year every year. After five years, it's 25 days, and this is one intercalary month. So yuga simply means yuga is connection. It's yuga, yoga, yoga, all these are cognates. They are the same family of terms. And this yuga uh, means the joining back the lunar and the solar cycles. So these are some of the definitions, the ritus, the seasons. Uh, the solar or civil days, the sidereal days, then the titi, which is uh, an, uh, a conventional uh, definition of the lunar day, uh, etc. So there are many more um, definitions there, but there are also, and that's very important, and I will be closing with this uh, in a minute, there are also lesser units of time. 
And here, it is about dividing the day. Having defined the day, either with regard to the sun or with regard to a star or some other system, how do you define it further down? So today we use 24 hours. This hour is of Mesopotamian origin, which came to India probably through the Greeks, much, much later. The Indian hour is not of 60 minutes. Uh, it is not 24 hours uh, of 60 minutes. It is rather 60 hours of 24 minutes, which comes to the same. But that's how it was defined. And this hour was not called hour. It was called Ghatika or Nadika. This was the definition of, for the basic uh, unit of time. And then from this, they built up further. For example, twice the Ghatika of 24 minutes. Anybody remembers what is the name for that double unit? Anybody remembers? It's a name that you all know, but in a different context. Twice the Ghatika is a Muhurta. So Muhurta is 48 minutes. We think Muhurta is the one auspicious time before sunrise, blah, blah, blah. No. This is just one particular block of 48 minutes, which is regarded as more auspicious. But the Muhurta is 48 minutes, that's all. So this is what Vedanga Jyotisha does. And then, of course, there are many other texts later on which we'll elaborate. But the question is, how do you measure? How do you measure these 24 minutes? You don't have watches. You don't have, of course, uh, uh, electronic devices. How do you measure time? So all civilizations have used different types of water clocks to measure time by using the passing of water, the flow of water. And here what you see is a traditional water clock still in use in a few temples of North India, very, very few. Uh, and uh, there is one somewhere in, uh, in fact, you re might remember when I showed you the BBC documentary right at the start of this course, we saw this man going to that temple and identifying a water clock because this, the time for the pujas was also regulated uh, by, by these. So how do you do that? And I was lucky to see an actual, uh, in a collection of a historian in Kerala, he had an actual uh, a water clock to show me. And this is nothing but a bowl of bronze. This bowl of bronze has a tiny hole at the bottom, and you lay it on a surface of water, as you see here. And then, of course, the water is going to rise through that hole. And the hole is so dimensioned that the water has to rise in exactly 24 minutes. Then, of course, when the bowl is full, it sinks. You take it again if you want empty it and put it back again, and you can do that 60 times a day. And that is actually how you will initially find the proper size for the hole. All you have to do is start from a very, very small hole. So of course, you will not get 60 times. If you're willing to sit 24 hours, you can, of course, have two, three people doing it and counting how many times from sunrise to sunrise you have turned your ball. And then you can keep increasing very patiently you can keep increasing the size of the hole until you have turned uh, 60 times from sunrise to sunrise uh, the ball. So this is uh, one way, but further, much later, and in other civilizations also, more elaborate water clocks uh, were conceived and executed. Uh, 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 but uh, this is, and, and finally, finally, uh, well, yeah, before we come to the last clock, uh, I should say that there is also this shanku, this Norman, what is a shanku? Nothing but a stick, usually of 12 angulas. It has to be properly measured and planted on a sundial. So that stick has many purposes. One is to determine the east-west line very precisely because when we ask people, how would you determine the eastern point, the east, when you don't have a magnetic compass, Usually people answer, well, I look at the, 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 the place where the sun rises. But the sun rises in the east only twice a year. For the rest of the year, the sun does not rise in the east. It keeps drifting back and forth, right? So the sun is not reliable. Unless you know that you happen to be uh, on the equinox, 21st of March, that's tomorrow. 
Yes, if you get up tomorrow morning and you look at the sun, you can say this is the eastern point. But you have to know that. If you don't, then you need other tools. And, uh, and uh, the, what was noticed long ago, and this is an Indian contribution, is that if you draw a circle and you simply measure the shadow of the angular, of the, of the uh, stick of 12 angulas, and you measure the point where the shadow crosses the circle when the sun rises, and then when the sun sets, the shadow will, get, will move the other way and will cross again the point which are called here <coughs> P and uh, P prime. It will cross it uh, at the other end of the day, and you take this line of the two points uh, at the intersections of the circle, and this is a proper east-west line. And it can be demonstrated. It's a bit of a tedious demonstration, but it can be done. So this is one use of the Norman. There is another use, which is to graduate that Norman, uh, the sundial, rather. You graduate it, and you can have a clock. But if you keep it flat, it's not going to work, because from season to season, the height of the sun is different in the sky, and you will have uh, different uh, and this is why when there was a serious attempt to make a sundial which would be valid in all seasons, it had to be what astronomers call equatorial. It had to follow the equator and not just be flat on the ground. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, and you cannot easily see, but there are graduations along this huge uh, leftmost uh, curve. And these graduations will work all year round uh, because <coughs> it is uh, oriented to the uh, equator. Uh, the equator uh, uh, of, of, of the, it takes into account the equator of the Earth. Uh, and therefore, it corrects uh, the, the defect that a plain sundial would have. So this is a colossal sundial built in the early uh, 19th century, uh, late 18th, early uh, 19th century, at a time actually when it was no longer required. Because by that time, watches, were, mechanical watches began, began to be fairly reliable. So in fact, much of the Janta Manta observatories, um, they were very elaborate. Uh, Jai Singh, who constructed them, uh, was a, a, a deep lover of astronomy and he had Jesuit astronomers in his court. He had um, um, Islamic astronomers and Indian astronomers. And he put all this knowledge together. This is a fusion of the three astronomies. It's not about his Indian astronomy alone. And constructed these enormous observatories, which actually very, very soon turned out to be useless. Because um, you can use them. You can. But they are, they are cumbersome, difficult to maintain. And in fact, uh, the telescope uh, was already coming into existence, had come into existence in Europe, and very soon made these observ observatories fairly <coughs> obsolete. But still, they are fascinating uh, in terms of conception and the different uses that the different instruments can be put to use. So uh, this is a very brief uh, travel through uh, measurement of units. There would have been a lot more to say, but uh, I think what we need to remember here is that uh, India produced an enormous numbers of systems of units. Uh, we could endlessly discuss them region-wise, epoch-wise. And um, uh, without this, without these units, uh, the Indian trade would not have flourished the way it did. Uh, uh, this is an essential component of uh, trade activities uh, for measuring things out. Uh, whether it is the state measuring them, whether the traders themselves, uh, whether the consumers themselves. Uh, this has been uh, one technology uh, which has served well uh, India's economic wealth. Thank you very much.